And welcome to the Living the Dream podcast. I'm Bethel Duran. As always, thank you a lot for all the support that you give me. It's going to be a different version today. I know I haven't done one in a while, and the ones that you have been hearing on this platform have been the boxing one, Thursdays with Joel Diaz and Roberto Diaz and Raza every now and then mixing in. Uh, but today's a special uh, edition of Living the Dream podcast. Uh, thanks to everybody that's been sticking by me, career-wise and podcast. And you know that I have this platform, even though I don't post frequently, but when I do... They're good ones. You better come strong. And that's what today is going to be all about. Um, This version also available on YouTube. So if you want to go to my YouTube page, Bethel Duran, just search that up and you'll be able to see today's guest. And he's an old friend, longtime buddy of mine personally and professionally. And every time he comes on the podcast, we just spew hours and hours. We're going to do this via (laughs) Zoom, but on Zoom, you're only allowed an hour. So we're doing it on a different platform. And it was pretty special. The reason I wanted to have Gustavo Arellano on today is because the LA Times over the weekend published uh, what I feel is some of their best journalism in a long time. And uh, before we get going, today's views and opinions are only mine and Gustavo Arellano's. They are not affiliated with the LA Times, where he is a columnist now. They're not associated with them at all. So don't think this is an LA Times podcast. But they published the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. I am 42 years old. I am a reporter here in Los Angeles, worked for the LA Times for a little bit doing their sports podcast. I thought I knew my Chicano reporter history uh, and the pieces done over the weekend. It was a big blowout uh, online and also on, in the print edition. And it was very, very well done. And you know anything about me, you know that I'm always very skeptical and also I hate pandering, this wasn't this. This was educational. And I learned so much about what was going on 50 years ago. And it's not just the death of Ruben Salazar, uh, who's become a martyr in the journalism world, especially with the Chicano students and reporters, but there are just so many different stories there. And I texted Gustavo, I said, hey, we need to do something about this because people read it, but I don't think they really embraced it. And if we can have the podcast Form for somebody who's younger that they can listen to. I like Gustavo, we got to do that for the people. Uh, so without further ado, let me bring on Gustavo Adriano, the newest columnist for the LA Times. Congratulations to, for that, Gustavo. Your new title is? Uh, columnist. Uh, yeah. That's simple as that. Columnist. Not Latino columnist, not Mexicano columnist. I am a columnist who happens to be Latino. And yeah, there it is, man. Yeah. Now explain to me what it was that the LA Times did this past weekend. Oh, oh about the, mator- the moratorium? Coverage? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, because uh, we do a lot of stuff. But no, like what we did, August 29th is going to be the 50th anniversary of something called the Chicano Moratorium. Now, the Chicano Moratorium itself was a, year, a year-long protest by Chicanos across the country to protest what they said was way too many Chicanos going to Vietnam, getting drafted to Vietnam, way too many Chicanos on the front line and then dying disproportionately. So there were protests that happened in Seattle. There were protests that happened in San Diego. There were protests all across the country. But the one that's most associated with the moratorium is going to, it was the one that happened on August 29th. You had over 20,000 marchers, mostly Chicano, but also you had black folks, white folks or whatever, marching in East LA. They started off in Belvedere Park. We all know Belvedere, of course. There was a rally there. Uh, Corky Gonzalez spoke uh, from the Crusade for Justice from Denver. There was Conjuntos. Then there's a peaceful march that winds its way down to what's now called Ruben Salazar Park, but back then was called Laguna Park. All of a sudden, sheriff's deputies, CHP, police officers, they descend chaos happens tear gases tear gas goes all over uh bullets start getting shot but police come out with their batons people fight back against them Molotov cocktails are thrown buildings are getting burned all sorts of chaos happens three people end up getting killed the most prominent one by far was ruben salazar he was a longtime reporter for the los angeles times but at the time now he was a news director for kame x canal 34 and he was also just starting as a columnist. He had started a column in February, early February, and he got killed by a tear, a tear gas projectile shot directly at his head from about 20 feet away. He was drinking at a bar called the Silver Cafe. So anyways, big, huge, impactful moment in the history of Mexicanos, of Latinos in Los Angeles. 
But once it happened, it basically disappeared. It was taught, of course, in Chicano Studies class, but who takes a Chicano Studies class, you know? It's not taught in your uh, high schools or whatever. So we knew, as the LA Times, one of our reporters was dead, was killed by this, but also there was a monumental uh, moment in LA history. So we decided to tell all, all the things that happened at the Chicano Moratorium that day, both leading up to it and then the aftermath. Now, Ruben Salazar was a reporter. He was 42 years old, I believe, which is same exact age as I am. And I only knew of him because when I got into this business, I started uh, associating myself with the California Chicano News Media Association. Yeah. And I believe they had a Ruben Salazar uh, scholarship. And that's yep. when I heard about that. I took a Chicano Studies class at, at El Camino. I never heard about it. Um, I took... I, it was never mentioned to it. It was more about the march. You heard, oh, he died. A reporter died on scene, but it wasn't the depth of it. But yeah. this moratorium wasn't just about um, a reporter dying. Why is it being celebrated 50 years later? Because, well, the reason why people only remember about Ruben Salazar is because a reporter got killed. Very few reporters in the United States ever get killed in the line of duty and when they do it's a big huge fucking thing for the obvious reasons i mean and you hear so many reporters like as they chauncey was his name chauncey gardner but black reporter killed uh by uh you know Na nation of islam folks up in mm -hmm. oakland who he was reporting on the uh, yeah chauncey gardner reporting on the corruption there don, don bowles in um in uh, Phoenix, he was reporting on the mob. They killed him with a car bomb. Uh, he, he worked for the Arizona Republic. Ruben Salazar, but you know, they, they, they were just reporting the line of duty. With Ruben Salazar, he became this martyr for the Chicano movement, even though everyone who knew him would say he is like the least likely person to be a martyr because he was, you know, he was a middle class Mexican American, didn't consider himself Chicano or anything. But the reason it's being taught today is, especially now, the reason people are making it such a big deal is because you see the parallels from 50 years ago to today. Fighting against the war, fighting, you know, against police brutality, fighting against racial injustice. And obviously now the whole issue is mostly with black folks and rightfully so. But 50 years ago was happening with Chicanos. And so they, you know, those who don't know the past are condemned to repeat it. And here we are. And one thing that I saw about this, I saw the tweets coming from the Times reporters. And you had mentioned something about it. I thought it was going to be a story. Here it is. Let's go. But the efforts brought by the LA Times staff, um, it seemed like it might be 20 people worked on this. I mean, how many stories were written? Oh, man. And it's not even how many stories were written. It's how many stories are, you know, the, the, the package itself. Let's see. You had Daniel Hernandez with the lead, which is just like the recollection of the people whose lives were changed because of the Chicano moratorium on a personal level. You had some people who became even harder ass activists. Some people said, fuck it. We're going off into the desert and we're not going to do it. You had Carolina Miranda talking about how the moratorium uh, changed art and culture in Los Angeles because of Chicano Moratorium. Basically, because of Chicano Moratorium, we have Dia de los Muertos. Because of Chicano Moratorium, you had this huge Chicano uh, mural scene and all this stuff. You had the perform, you know, the performance artist Asco and whatnot. So that's another story. Luis Sahagun, which is an old school. You, yeah. you said on Twitter that you know and love his stuff. Luis Sahagun so, was. I remember seeing his byline in the in high school when I was the sports editor yeah. of the Carson High Trailblazer. I saw that. I'm like, wait, that's a Latino name right there. Like, who is this guy? And because he was covering like San Diego, and he was all over the place. And he took. He's also a photographer. So um, I remember like that. That guy's cool. Then I hear in his story about somebody got thrown through a window into his abuela's tor tortillas shop. Like crazy. Tortilla. Oh man, someone got blown up. Got blown up thirty feet into the air. Crashed through his grand su abuelita's tortilla. And Luis didn't find out this fact until reporting this story, which it was a minute-by-minute minute account of the moratorium itself, from peace to complete chaos. That's a third one. A great young reporter, Dorani Pineda, she did a story about Ruben Salazar as a martyr. Like, how did he become the martyr that he is today? In other words, how did the movimiento turn him into a martyr? Robert Lopez, who's a spokesperson now at Cal State LA, used to be a great investigative reporter for the LA Times. He's been following the, the killing of Salazar for 25 years. A lot of people still insist that he was murdered, that he was tailed by the LAPD. Ruben Salazar himself was saying that he actually was followed by the LAPD. Robert found out through uh, pulling an FBI file that there was a fucking rata at the LA Times newsroom Whoa. who was 
who was reporting, who was ratting out what Salazar was doing to the FBI. So there's fucking ratas everywhere, man. That's five stories that I mentioned already. Um, I did a story about reading Ruben Salazar. Everyone makes him out to be this trailblazing Chicano reporter, amazing writer. He actually wasn't the best of writers. Yeah, like he used a lot of cliches. He used a lot of jokes. Like he did he referred to East LA and like uh, Montebello and La Puente and all that in a 1963 series of articles as the Serape Belt, which is not, not at the best of jokes. But so I mean, so that was my analysis reading of him. That's six stories right there. Other stories, they might drop tomorrow over the weekend. Kevin Baxter, who's a sports reporter, yep. he's actually doing a story up with Jaime Harin, who reported the moratorium. He was there at the moratorium. He won an Emmy for his coverage on it. I haven't read the story, but that just shows how awesome uh, Kevin is. And then Brittany, Brittany Mejia, another one of our rising stars at the LA Times, she's doing a story. Well, she did two stories. She did a story about the occupation of Catalina, uh, Catalina Island mm -hmm. by the Brown Berets. That was a great story. And then she's doing another story. So remember, the Chicano Moratorium was about uh, too many Chicanos going off to fight in Vietnam. Well, you know who always gets forgotten in this? The actual Chicanos who went to fight in Vietnam. So she's doing a profile of a couple of those veterans, like real literal veteranos and all that. So that's, I think, oh, Steve Saldivar, you know, my fellow yes. Cargaverense, he did a video talking to people so who good. were there at the moratorium. So I mean, good. Oh, no, uh, we did a map. And then the most important, in some ways, the most important things, Ben Welsh, who's one of our data, like I think our data god, he actually typed out all the columns Ruben Salazar did in 1970. The, almost all of them were unavailable unless, unless you had digital archives like ProQuest. Almost all of them were unavailable until now. So that's at least I mentioned what ten stories, probably a couple more. Oh, you know, and you said the young people aren't reading it. Oh no, everyone's reading it right now. Yeah. Everyone is. And this is the thing I always say about history. Once you actually read the history story, especially with young people, it sticks to them because they're like, "Why didn't I know about this?" This like they they could tell how huge this is. The first question they ask is like, well, why didn't anyone teach us about it? Yeah, that's what I was leading to there before we get into the meat of the stories. The teaching aspect, because it came out and I forwarded it to all my friends who are journalism teachers or high school uh, teachers, especially the, my friends that are history teachers. I'm like, here you go. Like, this is like assigned reading and not necessarily all over the country, but definitely in the in here in Southern California, you got to get after it. If you're an LA Unified School teacher, this got to be a oh, part yeah. of your curriculum there. Especially because I forwarded to some of my friends that teach in those neighborhoods that in their 20s and 30s didn't know anything about it. They knew the name, yep. but they don't know what's going on. Why did the LA Times go above and beyond with this feature? Because, frankly, the newsroom pushed for it. Uh, Daddy Hernandez, he was the one who first had the idea in February. But then, of course, coronavirus hit and everything got dropped. So many projects got dropped. And then around June, Steve Saldivar, he's like, hey, guys, we should Hey, Gustavo, real, real, quick, real quick, before you start mentioning names, give their titles, too. like Because not everybody knows who these guys are. So uh, I know. We're so inside baseball, yeah. right? So Hernandez so, uh, is... Uh, yeah. Daniel Hernandez, he writes for arts and entertainment. Steve Saldivar, he's in the video department, okay. mostly works with sports. Then you have Fidel Martinez, who's also in sports as social media. He's like, yeah, let's do on it. He's a Tejano, but he knew, like, this is important shit to do. And so then all these people meet are like, I want to do something. I want to do something. I want to do something. And, yeah, we just and, – and so it was the newsroom. And then, you know, kudos to the three editors who helped on this. My editor, Hector Becerra. Laurie Ochoa in Arts and Entertainment, and then Steve Padilla, whose dad actually used to be the football coach at East L.A. College for a long-ass time. So total Chicano, like, royalty there, and now he's the editor of our column one, which is our most prestigious really? story okay. of the day. Oh, yeah, when Chicano, you should have him on the podcast, actually. He's amazing. Yeah. Um, but So all of us together, we went to our boss, their boss, and they're like, look, this is an important story, and you have all – especially in a summer that's been very contentious for the Los Angeles Times. This is something that all of us united behind, and we really didn't have that much time. This is the type of project that you spend a good year on. We pulled it together, honestly, honestly, like in two and a half months. Mm. Two and Everything. a half months with that and pulling it all off together. Now, before we get to everybody else, what was your role? You mentioned you wrote about Salazar. But you had an interesting take because what you wrote about, I, I swear, Gustavo, you and I are the same. Not because we're both from Zacateca roots and have nopales in the backyard. Uh, but I read... Ah, sometimes a la frente. But uh, <laughs> for when I went to El Camino, 
and I heard about Salazar. Once I finally figured out that I wanted to be a reporter in my fourth year of junior college, I read a little bit about that. I, I got into this kick myself of, let me find out who are the Latino writers. So I did, uh, what was it, Sandra Cisneros, uh, Gary Soto, you know, uh, yeah. um, uh, anybody that you could think of that would kind of get me because I always told people, mentors of mine told me, find the people who are doing the job that you want to do and go yeah. do it. Uh, Jaime Diaz at the time was at the at Sports Illustrated. You know, just uh, Paul Gutierrez was at the LA Times yeah. at the time. So it was, I was picking that out. Salazar, I went and found his writings. Yeah. Um, um, what's that? The thing. Border, border no, 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 no. Um, that microfilm, micro, microfiche. Uh, yeah, microfiche. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you go to the library and you do that, yeah, right? So yeah. I started doing that, and I'm reading this, Bam. and I'm like, it's 1998, maybe, whatever. I'm like, yeah, this guy. Why are we making a big deal about it? Because I didn't know that the whole background of the Chicano movement and everything else like that. I hadn't read um, uh, Luis Rodriguez yet. You know, I, I, I didn't know anything about that. All I knew about East LA was, you know, La Bamba and Stand and Deliver. So I was the typical not connected kid. And I'm reading some of this. I'm like, I don't get it. Like, you, I was like, his writing's kind of sloppy. And I was just being a snot-nosed 20-year-old. You yeah. kind of had the same experience, but you read his book when you were yep. in college, right? Yeah. Well, it wasn't his book. It's called Border Correspondent. And it was it's an anthology of his writings. I was edited by Mario T. Garcia, this legendary Chicano studies professor from UC Santa Barbara. So I bought it at Chapman University. I wasn't I didn't even want to be a reporter then. I, I was still a film studies major. But I'm like, you know what? I want to be a, I want to be a Chicano. I want to get more politically active. And so I read his most famous piece. It was his, actually his inaugural column, February 6, 1970. It was called what is a Chicano and what does he want? And you read it, it is just like fire, straight up literary lightning. So I, a friend of mine gave it to me at Chapman, so I'm like, I gotta go buy this book. So I go to the old Libreria Martinez in, in downtown Santana, and I buy it and I start reading this stuff. I'm like, this is kind of cliched. Uh, you know, Latino, uh, Chicanos being, you know, Chicanos wanna speak Spanish. Chicanos don't like the police department. Chicanos don't like vendidos. Chicanos are perpetual victims. And I'm like, the writing is not even that good. It's kind of cliched. And so I gave that book away. And that was my perspective mm. on Salazar, frankly, for a long, long time until finally I, you know, finally I started getting not older, but more experienced. And I have to put them in, in consideration. It's like, he was a prophet, his, and it's funny because his writing, even his most ardent defenders, like I, for my piece, I interviewed uh, William Drummond, who's a longtime instructor at UC Berkeley. He basically started a journalism program at San Quentin State Prison, so this guy's Jeez. a legend. And he was also, you know, he was friends with Salazar. He was friends with Salazar. He was the second black reporter ever hired by the Los Angeles Times, and he's like, look, uh, Ruben was not a wordsmith. Uh, there's no sentences of him that I would say are incre like incredible or memorable. But what he was so important at is like he literally created this journalism genre. So he's writing about gentrification and fucking Santa Fe Springs in 1965, and we're still talking about gentrification all these years later. He did a story. Uh, it's, it's not no, it is online, uh, but it's not in the book about a, a, a gang. No, no, it, it was a rumble between a white gang and a Chicano gang in Pico Rivera, 1963. Well, guess who the cops arrest and guess who the judge throw the books at? These Chicanos. And so he writes it, hmm. it like, the, again, the writing wasn't the best, but you could tell like this guy's just a reporter. So now to consider Ruben is, he was amazing, he was a prophet. Like very few people can say, I invented a journalism genre, Ruben did. And he was doing it at a time where he was literally it. When he joined the LA Times, there was only four other Latino reporters and all three of them were kind of like, you know, the, the Pochos, like oh, like for crying out loud, one of them, his name was Lupe, but he they like in the byline it was Lupi, L U P I. That's how fucking Pocho he was. In <laughs> the more things change, the more they don't, right? It's uh, yeah. we're, we're having the same conversation, right? It's yeah, uh, exactly. You're we're talking about what's going on and the evolution, but uh, I know the LA, we're not getting. Without getting too inside baseball, the LA Times now has a Latino guild and a bunch of other stuff, and you're trying to get more Latino reporters. But this project, the way that it was done, um, it feels like it was a passion project for many of the people that worked on it. Because whether it was uh, Dorothy Pineda or Brittany Mejia, writers that I've never met, like I, I, you know what? You're the only writer that wrote anything that I've ever met. But I ah. see 
I, I because they're not sports people, so I don't see them in that yeah, world. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but it's I see them, and I I'm, I'm looking at, I'm reading this, and you can feel the words coming off of the pages for these writers. What was it like for you going back and saying, you know what, I messed up 20 years ago, and let me write about this man? Well, I mean, they gave me the task because I'm the fucking nerd of the L.A. Times. So I'm the one who has read all these stuff and I could put everything into a historical context. And by the way, one piece that I did that didn't come out for the moratorium because they're spitting it off into something completely else. But it's basically the history of Mexican hating at the Los Angeles Times. And that's a whole other Oof. trip right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, <laughs> it gets nasty. Just wait till the story comes out. It's. Uh, they really like it. I mean, that's how much they like it. It's about 2,500 words. That's how much they like it. No one writes that long anymore. But no, for the people writing it and for or, you know, for me to look back on this, I've always been honest with myself. And I still maintain that his writing wasn't the best. Like, it's not something that you're really going to remember. Uh, the, the, what, is, what is a Chicano? That one is like his one bolt of literary lightning. And then he has another couple of columns that – you remember, but you have to be honest with stuff. And, and you know, I, I was afraid that people were going to say, oh, there's Gustavo being the contrarian again. He always mm -hmm. said, siempre se tiene que echar así o lo que sea. So that's, you know, falta de respeto. But no, people are like, thank you for writing it. Like, not only is it personal, but you really get what Ruben Salazar, like you, like even Mario T. Garcia, again, he's basically his biographer. It's like, look, people made him out to be a martyr and he shouldn't be a martyr. We should remember him as, a reporter because he was a darn good one. That's literally what he said. And I would so go farther than Profe Mario and say, like, he was as great a reporter as you'll ever find. I mean, professional to the max. Now, you, in writing that story, uh, talked about the the bar where he was at. Like, he had covered the, the, the events of the day. Um, and the LA Times, once again, go and check it out. Read it online where you're, the LA Times, the... I don't even know what the graphics department, I guess, where if you're, it tells you they're at this park and it scrolls over and it gives you a layout of what's going on. It was so cool to see it online and the depiction. And it tells you, it takes you when you're at that bar and a bomb is thrown inside. Some people thought that it was a setup or like that, that was one of the conspiracy theories. Oh, that, yeah. No, to, to this day, people say that. Yeah. That he was a, ta he was a targeted. Yeah, no, I, I, I said this earlier, but of course I'll say it again. Ruben Salazar, he was – it's not just about you know Chicanos and representation. He was going after the LAPD for their fucking corruption, for their police brutality. There was a notorious case. He actually did this with Kame uh, Police, they went into an apartment. Uh, they thought it was a, it was a drug dealer uh, apartment. They shot two undocumented immigrants in cold blood. And then they, they try to excuse it by saying, eh, you know, they're undocumented immigrants. Or back in those days, even 1970, they were still called wetbacks. And I, I, who cares about wetbacks? Well, Ruben Salazar exposed this. He talked to the uh, witnesses and all that and totally embarrassed LAPD to the point where the police chief, Ed Davis, became his enemy right there. So Ruben, in the last days of his life, he was telling friends, he's like, I'm being followed by LAPD. And again, Robert Lopez, he did uh, in his story about tracking what actually happened with Ruben Salazar's death, he found out that the LA Times, a reporter at the LA Times, was being a snitch to the FBI about what Ruben was doing. This is, remember, J. Edgar Hoover is still alive in 1970. So, you know, of course, with all this happening, uh, you know, and so what ended up happening at that bar, so Ruben Salazar, he ducks from all the chaos. He's at the Silver Dollar Bar, which nowadays is a smoke shop, uh, but it's still there on Whittier Boulevard. He's, you know, waiting out everything. He's drinking a beer. Then uh, L.A. Sheriff's deputy says, oh, I got a call that there's uh, uh, someone holding people at the Silver uh, Dollar Cafe hostage. And so he fires a tear gas projectile into the bar about a foot long. That tear gas projectile hits Ruben in the head, kills him instantly. Raul Ruiz, the legendary uh, photographer and editor, he shot a picture that went worldwide. And you see the... Um, that Sheriff Stephanie holding up his uh, the 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 tear, tear gas gun up instead of down, and you see a woman trying to stop the guy. And the tear gas well, it couldn't have traveled the, the the projectile couldn't have traveled more than 15 feet. I actually showed this picture to a fan of mine who's a total NRA guy. I mean, this guy's so right wing. He actually bought me a membership for the NRA. That's how crazy he is. He's a Trump supporter. He had never heard about Salazar. But, you know, explaining it to him, he's like, oh, that sounds uh, that doesn't sound right. Then I showed him the picture and he, he was a military. He's like, no, 
they train you when you fire tear gas you fire it on the ground you don't fire it up i'm not going to wow. say what he accused the the sheriff's deputy of but that's why to this day people still insist ruben salazar was murdered the official report said it was an tr accident gone tragically wrong and that the guy didn't file uh, didn't the sheriff's deputy didn't follow training come on that's a fucking excuse there, it's there's so many different layers of that day now um i know you're busy but did you read all of the stories that were published dude i read them before they okay were, just make sure because you know you have so many things going on i want to make sure so i want to get into this La luis sahagun story the yeah. one where a guy gets blown up in his abuela tortilleria like tell that story oh man so again the the, the march happens the rally happens then the L.A. Sheriff's deputy, they said, oh, you know, we heard reports that a liquor store got robbed. And so they go in. And, of course, you have 20,000 people. You have activists. They hate the police. You also have cholos, which back then they were called vatos locos. And so they're like, we want to throw down with the police. So the, they start throwing – these people start throwing soda cans and soda bottles. And remember, this is the day when soda bo bottles were made of glass, not when they were mm -hmm. made of plastic. And so the sheriff's deputies, of course, okay, we're calling a riot. We're going to start throwing tear gas. We're going to start beating people up, all sorts of stuff. And so it, things start getting escal – things start escalating. Buildings get set on fire. People start throwing Molotov cocktails. So one of them, it, you know, it was a bomb, but it flew. A 15-year-old guy who was as a, working as a medic, really a volunteer medic for the Brown Berets, which was this paramilitary Chicano organization – Blows up the poor kid. The kid flies 30 feet up in the air and it crashes through the window of a tortilleria right there on Whittier Boulevard. Like you're, you know, here's you, you have the, the mujeres making their tortillas or don't know what the hell's going on in the front. And then a fucking kid cr crashes through the window. He actually survived for a couple of days before uh, he passed away. And uh, then another death, of course, was a guy was driving a car trying to crash through the police. They shot him dead, and you know at that point, well, you have to defend your life. But it was complete and utter chaos. But Luis, who's a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter for the LA Times, he's been with the Times for 35 years. Nowadays, he writes mostly about the environment. An amazing, amazing writer. So he's reporting this because that's of his generation. And as he's reporting it, that's why that's when he discovers, oh, this guy got blown up um, through my abuela's bar. And then so he talked to his mom. And his mom remembered what the, her mom, the grandma, said, and that the grandma said, like, yeah, you know, ¿qué están haciendo? What are these people doing? Like, you know, we, they're, like they're ruining all this stuff. Winter Boulevard was up in flames. It was a riot. I mean, you know, people were attacking their own neighborhood and just anger at what happened. That's a crazy story because when you're a reporter, you're always out there getting the story, but you don't ever want to become the story. But no. right, then you're thinking, wait, my abuela is only there con las tortillas, así nomás. And then a dude just comes through. And that's just a typical Mexican mom, female, where they don't tell you anything. Like, you don't no. think that the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter would have loved to have known that kind of factor. Where, you know, anybody else, hey, let me tell you the achievement right away. And that story gets passed down for generations. This dude oh, doesn't yeah. find out his uh, abuela's like 80 years old as he's working on a story about this. There's just yeah, so oh, many no. It, 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 it's family lore at that point and Luis like it's not the type of thing that you just keep to yourself and then Luis he's just a pro he's his job because he could he does it so beautifully it's like hey minute by minute account oh yeah so this guy got killed so where did he get killed oh yeah you know he got blown up through a tortilla a tortilla in Whittier Boulevard uh let me go check the address oh fuck it's uh my family's tortilla hey mom uh is this true? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh man. It, the, it, only someone. Like, yeah, it's such a Mexican thing, but also only someone like Luis pulls out the humanity. And you know, you don't want to be the story, but he just quick aside. Oh yeah. By the way, folks, this guy got blown up through my family's tortilla. Yeah. Quick aside. Now, Dorothy, Dorothy Pineda. Is that how you Dorani, say it? Dorani. Oh, Dorani. Dorani Pineda. Yeah. I, young reporter is a hustler, going out there and doing it. What does she cover? So she's from uh, East L.A. College. So shout out to East L.A. College, a graduate from there. And Cal I believe she was Cal State L.A. as well. So she covered about Ruben Salazar. So remember, here's a reporter who was not the Chicano radical people make him, make him out to be. For crying out loud, he lived in Orange County. 
in the nice part of Santana. That's just to show you how much of a Damn. you know middle class guy he was. Married a white woman. Uh, by all accounts, was a bon vivant. Liked his French food. Liked his cocktails. Well, you know, wasn't a tequila drinker. Uh, he, you know, I liked his bourbon and especially his wines. Uh, always dressed like a professional in the suit and tie or whatever. So he, after he gets killed by the sheriff's deputy during the Chicano moratorium, he all of a sudden becomes a martyr. People start painting posters in his name. The park gets named after him. There's a school in Chicago named after Ruben Salazar. The California Chicano News Media Association names his scholarship after that. There's streets named after him, murals. Like, he becomes a legend. Even though, again, the people who say, who knew him, they're like, Ruben would have been the first person to laugh at the idea that he was the martyr of the Chicano movement. A lot of people died during the Chicano movement in different, like, car bombs in Denver and whatnot, but the only person that people ever remember is Ruben Salazar. So Dorani did this great job of just talking about sort of the chronology of Ruben, and people, and things are still happening right now, like, to make him out to be, uh, you know, that martyr that he really doesn't, I mean, he was a martyr because he, he the, the definition of a martyr is you get killed doing what you believe in, but what Ruben believed in wasn't the Chicano movement, it was uh, being a reporter. That's what he, mm. that he died in the line of duty. In the line of duty, that's uh, it's crazy to say that in the line of duty as a reporter, you're covering the news. Look, during uh, the protests a few months ago, you were in the middle of the streets in Orange County doing the same exact yeah. thing, and it it makes you wonder, like you know, there's reporters have died in war zones. You don't ever expect to die on your beat in your backyard. It's no. You, you, you don't expect to die in the United States as a reporter, but reporters are all – it's one of the most – it's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world for sure. So many reporters get killed nonstop. I forgot to say one story, by the way. Esta Vanessa Martinez and um, – oh, boy, I'm blank. Oh, Julia Barajas, they did an awesome story about the women who used to be in the Brown Berets. Mm -hmm. They got tired of the machismo, and then they started their own group called Las Adelitas, which also was pioneering. And my favorite part about that story, they mentioned, you know, Las Adelitas, they named themselves after the nickname for the Guerreras, the, Mex the women who fought during the Mexican Revolution. And there's a famous corrido called La Adelita, and so that's where they got the name from. So these women, they're marching during the moratorium, and they want to sing La Adelita, but they're like, nah, man, there's too many lyrics. So, uh, there's too long of a song, so we're just going to hum it. And it's so true. If you know the song, it is a wordy ass fucking song. It's a beautiful song, but I know the, the, the only part, the only part that people remember. See the Adelita, na 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 na. I mean, everyone knows the, the the tune to it, but the words now. So that actually, I think, was one of the highlights because Vanessa, you want to talk about hustle? She's a, a, a data reporter. She's a graphics reporter. She coded the entire package which looks totally awesome, old school fonts or whatever. So she did this reporting as a side hustle and Julia, another great uh, up and coming reporter. So they, I, I think that was actually probably the highlight. That's the one, that's the, the story that for me, I was most surprised by because I thought I knew the history and I didn't know it at all. Yeah, I read that one twice because I was like, wait a minute, did I miss something here? It's uh, Vanessa Martinez and Julia Barajas, the women of the Brown Berets, Las Adelitas de Atzlan, break free and form their own movement. That's that story. Carolina Miranda, now she, that's a rock star right there. Oh, yeah. She did something about the arts and the murals and the culture. What was that about? Well, it, you know, after the moratorium, you have all these activists and all this, you know, art and activism go hand in hand. So right after this, I mean, it was a traumatic event. People died. Whittier Boulevard got destroyed. The, the mo momentum of the Chicano movement really dissipated after that. So our, all these artists, they go retreat back into their art groups and they start doing stuff. So you start seeing the murals, all, you know, uh, LA is the mural capital of the world. A large part of it is because of the Chicano, act of, the Chicano artists who started doing murals in honor of Salazar, in honor of the Aztec legacy, Cesar Chavez and all that. That starts happening from the moratorium. You have this legendary group named Asco. It's a performance group, and they start doing stuff off of the moratorium. Uh, Patsy Valdez, Gronk, Willie Aron Jr., um, you know Harry Gamboa, uh, Willie Aron, uh, Harry Gamboa Jr. They do. They did this great piece. I, there was another moratorium that happened afterwards where another guy got killed. But right afterwards, they took a picture of themselves as calaveras, or digo as catrines, and as catrines. In other words, as skeletons having a, a, a fancy dinner on Whittier Boulevard. And I think the 
title of the piece is called Dinner After a Riot. So they start doing all this great stuff after that. You have music coming out of the moratorium. You have plays coming out of the moratorium. You have, more importantly, as I said earlier, right after that, you have something called self-help graphics start up uh, out of the moratorium and self-help self-help graphics happens to be the place where Dia de los Muertos, which everyone and their mother and their hipster uh, uh, gabacho boyfriend celebrates now, but it started all as a result of the moratorium. And also, you know, just uh, geography and landscape, all that changes. And only someone like Carolina Miranda, who's half Chilean and half Peruvian, but basically a Chicana par none, only someone like her could pull that off. Yeah, it, it's uh, pretty cool to see that. And the people who were involved and she's speaking to Chicano studies professors at the University of Minnesota the pictures of Dia de los Muertos in 1973 you know I'll be honest I thought Dia de los Muertos started three years ago right uh, because everybody with their 15 sugar, years ago oh, yeah. yeah sugar skulls right I'm like what's a yeah, sugar yeah. skull like what, what are you talking about <laughs> that became the cool thing so we're going to see that one uh, Carolina Miranda but the murals I didn't know this Gustavo um, when I'd go visit our family that lived uh, Porla Evergreen uh, right there in East yeah. LA or in Boyle Heights, I might be over there. Uh, shout out to the Don Lucas. Um, I would see murals painted. I didn't know that these buildings were the projects. You know, I didn't yeah. know that Estrada Courts and Ramona Gardens. I didn't, I'm a little kid, I didn't know that. And I always thought, that's cool how you have these murals out there. Now, as a grown up, it's like, wow, they were put there for a reason. The, the black and white mural at Estrada Courts. Uh, that came from that movement, didn't it? Oh, yeah, no, because these artists, they saw, I mean, they were all politically active, and, you know, they were going to go back to their communities, and they wanted to bring art to the community, so they started putting up in Estrada Corps. They put them all over East L.A. Uh, you know, they put it on East L.A. College. Like, it, the, you had this flowering of murals and murals of course again la is a mural capital of the world there's amazing murals still getting popped up especially now with kobe and nipsey and all that but all those all that mural movement started with these chicanos who got radicalized to bring their art to the people from 1970 judy baca uh, i mean all these people just started doing all sorts of murals because of that and it's uh you when you read the story they're talking to people at the smithsonian like this, yeah it's a like, oh, no, it's worldwide, man. I mean, but we, we, we were talking just here's this one moment in time and yeah. here's all the different tendrils that spread all across society. Yeah, the one that I'm looking at right now is called First Supper After a Major Riot in 1974. That's the one. Uh, yep. on, on Whittier Boulevard. I'm like, wow. I'm like, I've seen that so many times. I just never made the connection. That's why I love reading this story that Chicano Moore Turner, the LA Times published over the weekend about what happened there. It wasn't just... The more, that march that day, the fights, it wasn't just the death of Ruben Salazar, it was so many different things. Like, I didn't know this. As a kid, I used to play in the Coca-Cola baseball tournament where we would go and play, and it was based in East LA. We would play at Belvedere Park, one of the other ones, Salazar Park. I, yeah. like, now we, I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my goodness, like, como mento que soy, but I'm not, yeah. I, I, I kind of want to beat myself up about, about it because I should know better, but at the no. same time, we weren't taught this. Why? Because, well, first of all, the history of Mexicans has never mattered in California historically, not to white people. Uh, you start seeing this Mexican, people care about Mexican history once Mexicans start being teachers and professors and administrators and realize like, hey, this Mexican Chicano history in California, it's also American history as well. So maybe we should start teaching it in the classrooms. But still, I mean, especially with, uh, you know, public education, what is taught? Like there's all sorts of regulations that go with it. And only until recent years have you seen a loosening of those standards and like a push for ethnic studies to teach you about this stuff. And it's funny because the right, they say, oh, ethnic studies just teaches students to hate America and radicalizes them. And my response to them is like, it's all American history. Why are you so scared about American history? What's so scary about that? So, it, I mean, so it's gotten to the point, like, where even people like yourself, even people like me, I didn't learn this history in school. I didn't learn it in college. Like, I learned it, frankly, on my own and just digging through this stuff. But what I always tell people is like, and, and also I think sometimes people say, oh, people don't care about history. History is in the past. People, especially this generation, they just want about the present. I have never seen that to be the case. If anything, I'm actually working on a story talking about how history now is cooler more than ever because you see these young people going on Instagram, doing like digging these archives and all that and teaching people and getting all these likes and people spreading all that stuff. There's a thirst for a history. And because 
frankly, then they start questioning everything else. Well, why didn't I learn this in high school? And if I'm not learning that, if I didn't learn that in high school, what else am I not learning? Yeah, there's so many different stories. Like I said this, like I mentioned it, and I send it to all my teacher friends. I'm like, if anything, learn it for yourself. And, you know, the National Chicano Moratorium against the Vietnam War in East LA. Yeah, uh, it was the biggest gathering of Mexican American demonstrators in the U.S. It was like close to 20,000 people going down Whittier Boulevard to what was then Laguna Park. Then the violence erupted. Gustavo, this is 1970. We're in 2020. 50 years later, history repeating itself, it seems like. Those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And you know what? You could change the faces and let, let's get all political now. But until you actually change the institutions, nothing's going to change. So now uh, I think LAPD's like 50 percent Raza. I know the Border Patrol is definitely 50 percent Raza. You still have, you know, sometimes uh, the, the Raza cops are the worst cops. I mean, you go into the barrios, they actually tell you like, no, the, the most racist cops are the Mexicans against the Mexicans because they're trying to prove themselves. It's the good old boy network. It's still the LAPD of William Parker and Daryl Gates and Ed Davis and all these other people. So, you know, I the hope for me is that people get this history and say, like, OK, why are we still in this moment 50 years later? Why is still there so much poverty among Latinos, even before coronavirus? Why do we have all these disparities? What is the problem? Like the, the people who the few people who do get into the system, they get changed by the system. At what point are you going to change a system to better ourselves? You know, it. OK, exactly. The system to better yourselves. And look, I've been I've been one of those where. You and I have had our discussions where it's like, okay, what are you going to do with the Chicano Studies degree, Mike? But you don't have to get the degree in it, but know it. Educate yourself about it. And, you know, the Chicano Moratorium, I've always been fascinated by it, I guess, because I didn't know anything about it. So I always kind of threw myself in there and tried to read stuff about it, but there was never anything there. And when you now have a, the LA Times going above and beyond, because we doubt it. They didn't have to do this. They could have just yeah. wrote one story. Here's what it is. But to put the manpower in, the hours, the budget, the time, everything else, how important is that in journalism today? Oh, God, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. I mean, people have written about the moratorium, but in academic books that no one reads, only academics read. So to have a, a, an institution, I mean, and look, the LA Times doesn't have the power, or it does. People say the LA Times doesn't have the power it used to. That's bullshit, man. When people say, "Oh, you came out in the LA Times," it still means something. Oh to yeah. People. Even the oh, young, yeah. yeah, even the younger generation, they get impressed by that. So to see a paper by, like the Los Angeles Times spend so much effort into doing this, getting a package in the print edition, but also the online component, and also the tweets and the videos and all that, it is absolutely huge. It's basically, uh, you know, we telling the public, this is your history and you should care about it. And we've gotten so much great feedback from not just old people, from but young people, not just from Mexicanos, but from all sorts of folks. So this is just proof that hey, we should do more of these. We should find this. I mean, I did that last year with my Prop 187 project with the podcast. Same thing. I mean, that was a little bit different because that was all just a singular effort because it was also a personal effort for me. But people reacted kind of, you know, well to that. The podcast was a hit. People enjoyed it a lot. And so the more we do these things, the more, you know, it's, it's I view it as something that feeds itself. The more you do it, the more people want it, the more you should do it. And even if people didn't want it, you should still do it because it's the right thing. And you never know, by the way, when these things pay off. Like, I, you know, I've, of course, been on this history beat forever. I, almost a decade ago, I used to do a, a column for the OC Weekly called Profiles in Orange County Pioneers Who Are Clan Members. In other words, people... Wait, wait, wait. wait slow that down. Slow that down. Profiles in Orange County Pioneers Who Were Clan Members. Like Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, what other clan is there, man? I'm just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote that? Uh, for two years, I did a series because I found the membership <sighs> roles of the Ku Klux Klan in Orange County during the 1920s. So every year for two years, I'd pick a name. I'd give the biography. There's streets. I, you know, this is 2010. There's streets named after these people. Schools, parks. There were uh, sh uh, two Orange County sheriffs were Klan members. Uh, heads of the Republican Party and Democrats were Klan members, all these people. So I did this at this point a decade ago, and oh, people hated that series. Like, oh, first they're like, how do you know this, uh, the list is real? 
Well, because it was written by one of the founding fathers of Orange County history, a guy named Leo Friss, uh, who was also the city attorney in Anaheim and apprenticed under the guy who destroyed the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, well, these, you know, the Klan was different in the 1920s. It wasn't really racist. Bullshit. Uh, well, these men are dead and they can't defend themselves from these allegations that you're doing. So a decade ago, I did these stories. No one cared. This year, Plummer Auditorium in Fullerton renamed because a plumber was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Fanning Elementary in Fullerton, in Brea, they tried to rename it uh, last year. No, it went nowhere. This year, they finally renamed it. And all these monuments, there was a the largest monument to the Confederacy was in um, at uh, the uh, Fairhaven, no, Santa Ana Cemetery in Santana. This was a 500 pound granite obelisk to the Confederacy that was only set up in 2004. I wrote about it. No one did anything until finally people realized it. So these stories, history matters. If you write about history, you can change history. That's why I always tell people, know your history. And history will catch up to you eventually. What's been the reaction to this from your colleagues and peers? Nothing but praise. People have loved it. People have said, great job. Okay, now, now you know, what about the non-Latinos? Yeah, no, of course, the non-Latinos. I'm saying the non-Latinos. No, they're, they're not going to tell you, but any, any, you heard anything? Like, you know, There's always the people like, yeah, that's cute. Yeah, you know, if there's if those people are in the Times newsroom, I haven't heard from them because all I all we've heard is just praise from everyone from the top. We got a nice note from Norm Perlstein, the editor of the LA Times, who sent it out to the newsroom. We got a lot of you know, the, especially on Slack, thumbs up and all that crap. People retweeting our stories and all of that. I haven't heard any grumbling. Let's put it that way. Okay, well, there's there's usually is. That's why I'm curious <laughs> about it. No, because when you go and you go this extensive and you this you know. Uh, micro because it's about Chicanos. It's like, whoa, well, what's going on? But at the same time, yeah. kudos to the LA Times realizing that, hey, our population, our audience, somebody's going to have some kind of connection here. You mentioned it. You grew up in, in uh, Anaheim. I'm in Carnage, but we knew somebody there. What's going on? Gloria Molina, the supervisor, one of the first elected yeah. Latino uh, officials in LA County, was there that day as a teenager. So everybody has some kind of connection. And the political world was changed because of that uh, event also. Because you had people yeah, you, who became activists and wanted to get into government, didn't they? Oh, yeah. No, because of that. I mean, whenever you have active, look at Proposition 187. 25 years ago, or now almost 26 years ago, this proposition so radicalized that generation that now they run the California state as a legislature. They all, end, like, they all marched. When they were in the early 20s, and now they run the damn state. So same thing with the Chicano Moratorium. All these people, young people, teens in their 20s, they ended up becoming the Gloria Molina. They ended up becoming, um, you know, the Luis Rodriguez is. They ended up becoming, este, like, all these other people who were there. They got radicalized. It was galvanized. There was, like, these moments. The so same thing with the Black Lives Matter movement. I guarantee you this generation is going to, in 20 years, they're going to be the people running this fucking shit. Or, you know, oh, this is another word I was going to use, but I can't <laughs> use it. But, yeah, you know what I mean. But, um, but no, I mean, th this is the importance. And, and you that's why you need to know your history to also realize what you're doing is not new. There are predecessors behind you, and you should know your history because that will let you know who you are, and that will help you go to where you need to go. You know, when you work on projects like this, because when you're a reporter, your most important thing, you say it over and over, is don't get beat. You want to be the first one with the story. You want to outwork. You want to outsource. You want to have everything. But when you work on a group dynamic like this and you see something that is evolving into something special, for you personally, how was this ride? Well, it's, I mean, it's pride. It's complete pride. I was so proud of my colleagues. I was... I was proud to be part of this package as well. I was proud of my newspaper to be able to publish this, and I'm just very humbled by all the positive feedback that we're getting from all across the country. That, that that's all it is. I mean, especially with a project like this, like you know, you know, newsrooms are always filled with jealous folks or whatever. Um, and but this, there was no, there was no ego in this. It's like we got to do this. We got to do it right. Let's help each other out. Like we help. Like people say, hey, do you have the contact for this person? Like there was one point I was reading all these stories. I'm like, hey, you know what? We're quoting this Mario T. Garcia a lot, even though he deserves to be. Uh, quoted by the professor at U, uh, of Chicano studies at UC Santa Barbara. So we had that discussion. Like, 
we're watching for each other's backs. Good. Let's put it that way. Uh, you know, someone asked me, do you have Gloria's phone number? Oh, here. I don't have it now, but I know who has it. Go for this person. Oh, here's a book that you folks should read to give you more insight into that. You know, it's collaborative. It, it seemed like everybody enjoyed working on this because the tweets that people had that day when the stories came out or the next day, it, everybody, whether it was uh, Dorani Pineda or Miranda or yourself or Hector Brissetta, the editor, it was they took you to where they were at during this project. It's rare to see in journalism, especially when you have egos involved, because we all have ego as a reporter. You want to be the best, especially when you're working on a collaboration. But to see that and pull it off, kudos to you and everybody involved with that. It's, uh, it was pretty cool. I, I, and I know I hit you up and I'm like, look, we got to talk about it for the people who haven't read it. My audience, your audience. And it's like, let's give yeah. us something different. We do the podcast version. We do the YouTube version. This was cool. And there was no gritando, yeah. no arguing, no ask, no grita le guti. But you do have a bunch of stuff <laughs> that you can promote. If you guys love Gustavo, definitely check out uh, Gustavo's newsletter. Uh, uh, Thank you. It's um, on Saturdays. It's Gustavo published. Arellano's weekly. Go to GustavoArellano.org. Every Saturday you get something. And then also uh, Tuesdays at 1015 Instagram Live. Uh, ask Gustavo whatever you want. It's a pretty cool little experience that he's got going on where he just answers your questions, and it, there you go. So, Grita Leguti, uh, the new California columnist. And you know what? All right, because people don't know this. Take us outside of baseball. California columnist, is that a big deal? Of course it's a huge but deal. For the I mean, commenter, only... for the commenter, why is it a big deal? Because I am uh, getting to a platform that very few people get as a, a columnist basically says you could do any story you want, but you could also give your – the newspaper gives you way more – Oh, he's freezing up. See? They're trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to censor him. Frank Del Olmo. Hold on. They're trying to censor Gustavo. Yeah, they're trying to censor me. There it is. You start talking about you, – you, you said I can do whatever I want, and they censored you right away. Oh, no. I, I, All right. I, I, so a I California columnist, you said, right before Frank Delomo, what were you saying? I, you know, I'm following in the footsteps of Ruben Salazar, or Frank Del Olmo, of Hector Tovar, Agustin Gursa, George Ramos, all these legends, and very few people. So now, even though I'm not them, and I, you know, I'm going to talk about this in my first column, like, I'm not them, and people shouldn't expect me to be them. People should allow me to be the individual, the, you know, the totality of who I am. I know there's a lot of expectations. There's not enough Latino columnists, period. I'm one of the very few. So uh, people are going to have expectations of, of me. I welcome it, but I'm not going to pay attention to their expectations. I'm going to pay attention to my expectations. And if people know me at all, I have more... I have huge expectations. I always do. I always love challenges. Bring it. There it is. The, Cal the newest California columnist for the LA Times, Gustavo Arellano. Also, El Profe at Orange Coast <laughs> College. You can take his intro journalism class. And he's a certified colonel by the state of Kentucky. So Absolutely. many things going on. He has books. You can read them all over the place. But, of course, follow him on Twitter, Gustavo Arellano. Uh, Instagram, Gustavo underscore Arellano. And if you hate in and out Gustavo is your man. Uh, food reviews. They're few and far between now, but at the end of the day, Gustavo, you and I, we got to go have some tacos, go have some Mexican food. We'll do that very soon. Michelada Salta Baja Market. Yes, um, Alta Baja Market. Anything else you got to plug? Because you got 8,000 other things. Uh, that's it, man. Grita la Guti every Tuesday at 10.15. Ask me whatever. It's pretty fun. Uh, it shows how much of a fucking nerd I am. <laughs> oh, man. You know what, Gustavo, just for that, I'm going to go have some tequila. Oh man, Tequi I'm gonna I'm gonna get some bourbon right now. Tequila Don Ramon. So Gustavo, as always, un abrazo. Thank you very much. The man from Jerez, Zacatecas, and a crime, and now the newest California column. So go and check out all the work done by the LA Times, uh, the Ch Chicano Moratorium. It is available. And if you don't uh, have a password, hit me up. I'll give it to you, and my answer will be pay the damn money. Support good journalism. That's what it's for. <laughs> Adios, Gustavo. We'll talk to you soon, bro. Cuídate.